Later. And now we'll move into the panel discussion. I'd like to experiment, and because there are four panelists, that might be quite a bit of clapping. And I'm wondering if you have tried what I see the young people doing. It is sign language clapping. So what you do is. See how it goes. And <laughs> uh, <right. laughs> so the um, the first of our panelists, I'm just going to give you their names now. And what will happen is that uh, they will do individual presentations, approximately five minutes each. Following that, they will have the opportunity to comment, if they choose, on presentations by the other panelists. And then we'll move into the question and answer period. So, first of all, Andrew Barton, would you uh, present yourself, <laughs> please? <laughs> there we go, okay. And uh, please help us out here. Uh, Krista Grace Warren. Yes. Next time we have her coming on here, yeah, that's great, Krista, thank you very much. Brian Gunn. <laughs> there, there we are, Brian Gunn, and lastly, Brian Faulkner. Okay, there's our panelists for the for the evening. Uh, so what I'm going to, so first of all, Andrew, uh, from your uh, information online, I expected that you're a real young whippersnapper from Kelowna. <laughs> I see you have a few gray hair. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that's experience, and uh, the, what I uh, thought was that it's, it's amazing the way that you have combined your talents of photography and academic research. He's very audacious. Do you know what this guy is, is doing with, that, with, what, with his work? He thinks that we in BC need help. Over, <laughs> right. <laughs> and what he's doing with that production is contacting, connecting with people all across Canada and saying, Oops, hey, look, here's what we're up against here. Look at these communities. Look at these people living. Look at the consequences for them. And, you know, think about us, connect with us. That will help. Will all is it, would that be a fair assessment of your audacious <laughs> endeavor? Okay. Um, would you please take the uh, take the mic? Thanks very much for the introduction. We got a little sound here. How's that? Hello. Hi everyone. No, all right. I'll do that. Okay. There we go. Uh, first of all, I just want to say uh, thank you very much to everybody for inviting me here tonight. I uh, really feel privileged to be here and uh, to be speaking to uh, such a, a great audience. Um, I must say, when there's events like this in Kelowna, um, there'd probably be the front row would be full and that would be about it. Um, <coughs> but anyway, I'll try and just give you a brief overview of uh, who I am and uh, what I've been doing and please tap me on the shoulder if I start waffling on too long. Um, so, as has already been mentioned, I'm a, a little sort of older than the average student. Uh, four years ago, uh, I could call it a midlife crisis, I decided that uh, I no longer wanted to be an IT manager and uh, I wanted to try and contribute something to uh, some of the environmental issues that we're having. So I went back to the University of British Columbia and started an undergraduate degree in um, uh, geography and uh, I'll be finished in April, which will be quite wonderful. And uh, as part of that journey, uh, in 2012, I was given a um, undergraduate research award for um, a proposal that I put forward uh, to do some research on the Northern Gateway. Because when I first heard about Northern Gateway, uh, the thing that I really wanted was, what do the people who live in that area think? What, what is their idea of this whole thing? And also, what if I could take people from uh, other parts of Canada into those uh, parts of BC and Alberta and show it to them how would, um, uh, how would that influence things. 
So I started off by uh, doing what we call a, a qualitative review of um, testimony that came from the uh, joint review panel hearings. And I looked at it from the point of view of sense of place. So how do people connect to the homes, to their homes, and how uh, do people express uh, their love for the places that they live in? So I, I looked at that, and, and um, many of the quotes that you saw in the video were the result of that work. And then after uh, looking through all of that, those transcripts and spending uh, many, many hours in front of my computer screen uh, doing that, and uh, being brought to the point of tears on many occasions by the, the power of the testimony given by some, I, I then drove from uh, Brunerheim, uh, in just uh, to the uh, northeast of Edmonton, and that's an area called uh, the Industrial Heartland, and that's one end of the pipelines, and drove all the way through to Kitimat, uh, taking photographs along the way and just taking my own ideas about uh, the landscape that I was passing through. And then uh, so as to try and uh, bring in the ideas of, uh, of uh, what the tanker traffic will mean, um, I went up to Prince Rupert and then across to, to Haida Gwaii, as you, you saw in the, in the video. So then I tied that all together in, uh, to an e-book and, uh, and the video that you just saw. And uh, I must admit, I, I became very attached to that, uh, to that area. I was um, very uh, moved by the testimony of the, the people that live in that region that I read. Um, I was uh, overwhelmed with the hospitality that I received from people that I met along the way. And uh, as I said in the end of the video, it just turns out that this is a, a really bad idea. Um, on Haida Gwaii, uh, many of the people that I spoke to, I never realised uh, how much uh, subsistence um, fishing still was a, such an important part of life and uh, damaging that ecosystem, that marina ecosystem up there, uh, would really mean uh, the end of livelihoods for, for many, many people. Um, so that was, that was my objective with this whole thing, was to try and communicate uh, the human side of the impacts of Northern Gateway. And uh, I think my time is up. That, that time really flies. <laughs> and, uh, thank you. Krista, uh, no, you're, do you want to go next? Or do you, or, um, that, that would be okay. And we'll just pass that hand, Mike, or, okay, you're going to go, Brian? Okay. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I would do that, and uh, that, that's okay. That, and sorry, I have to be a little, I have to scramble here a little bit. So, um, I, you know, what I was wondering, Brian, is what you think when you read that you are retired. From what I um, see of your activities, I would say you're far from retiring. And uh, uh, Brian, uh, Brian Gunn is a professional engineer. He's banded with others in an organization called Concerned Engineers. In that capacity, uh, he uh, helped with the submission to the joint review panel with regard to the Northern Gateway Pipeline, of course. And that is an evaluation of the tanker risks associated with the safety of the Northern Gateway Pipeline. He's also very active in the uh, BC Wilderness, uh, the world, which is the uh, Wilderness Trade uh, um, a, a Tourist Association, BC, that um, believes that wilderness tourism is a viable and sustainable economic enterprise. Uh, but what I'm, so let's just turn it over to Brian and uh, um, please proceed. Thank you uh, very much for inviting me and uh, for that introduction. Uh, <clears throat> you mentioned uh, retirement, and I guess when I was younger, I had the vision of getting to be 65 and sitting in a rocking chair with a glass of scotch in front of the fireplace and reading about climbing mountains. But that hasn't happened, so. Uh, if you look at my resume, I spent a considerable amount of my life uh, uh, out there building large bulk marine coal handling terminals, which I'm sure a lot of you uh, may not appreciate, but it's something that uh, I did with a lot of vigor. And, uh, and in those days, when we built Roberts Bank, the big terminal at West Shore, there was no 
uh, environmental review process. We just went ahead and built it. We built it in about a year and a half. And these projects are now taking five to ten years to build with a lot of, uh, with a lot of hearings and a lot of uh, uh, investigation on the environment. I also went to South Africa and uh, expanded their coal terminal there, which is the largest single coal terminal in the world, from 24 million to 44 million tons. After, uh, after that uh, work, I uh, went into the operations field and actually worked for the coal terminal at West Shore and came to understand the operation uh, needs and how these plants operate. And from there, I uh, didn't like the operating environment much and always wanted to follow a dream of mine, which was to become a cowboy. So I went up to the interior, found an old uh, piece of property with a beautiful house on it, and started the Big Bar Guest Ranch. So, as they said in the trade, I went from horses' asses to real horses, so, uh, for people. And that was an eye-opening experience, because as hard as I worked uh, managing large jobs, I worked a lot harder as an individual business owner. But I came to develop a great appreciation for the land and the problems on the land. I eventually left that because of some health problems and uh, my kids didn't want to run it and I ended up, after meeting a lovely lady from Strathcona Park Lodge, moving down to the island. And uh, <coughs> as a result of my work in the, in the caribou uh, and uh, my appreciation for the land and the problems we saw down here with the forest industry and tourism, we started the Wilderness Tourism Association and that was started in 99, and it is focused on, uh, on the issues between industry and tourism, and uh, the, their land use issues, fish farming issues, mining issues, oil and gas issues. And uh, I spent a considerable amount of time doing advocacy work for that. And in that position, I actually sat on the North Coast Land Resource Management Plan table in the early, the late 90s and early part of this uh, new century and looking at uh, the Great Bear Rainforest and those type of things and developed a great appreciation for that coast. So where does that leave us? Uh, as a result of that, and uh, my, when the Northern Gateway project came along, I felt strongly that uh, this was the wrong project for the wrong place and uh, managed to convince some other engineers that uh, Northern Gateway was not the place, the North Coast was not the place to put in the terminal. And first, first of all, when I looked at it, I said, why would you possibly want to take those ships through 160 nautical miles of twisty channel to Kinnaman when you could go out to Prince Rupert or you could go to Port Simpson with only at Port Simpson one hour at the open ocean, Rupert two hours, and Kinnaman 16 hours where the big risks are. And that's what got us interested. So I managed to get together some professional engineers and we looked at risk. And we looked at the risk of <coughs> this pipeline from an engineering point of view. You have to understand engineers are basically uh, developers, and, uh, but they have a conscience and they do care about the future. And uh, these people did join in this and they came to the conclusion after much study that this was not a good project, uh, it was not a safe project. Uh, and, uh, and so with that sort of Conclusion half formed, we went on a trip north and visited all the First Nation communities, arranged prior meetings, and we also uh, visited some of the other communities, and that re-confirmed uh, our feelings about the pipeline project. One, one minute ago. So, so what we're doing now, we, uh, in addition to producing a paper, we've been to the hearings, and uh, we've... Uh, 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 consulted, uh, we've been to the hearings in, in uh, March last, uh, in 2013, and we've been to the final argument hearings, and uh, our conclusions remain firm. So basically, uh, we're, in addition to that, we've submitted to letters to the articles to the Association of Professional Engineers, and uh, we uh, come to the, our final opinion has been, and it's, it's unresolved, and that the Northern Gateway Pipeline, the estimated risks are too high, and this project enjoys a substantial risk premium that the public is underwriting. 
The consequences of Dilbert spills and the possibility of cleanup are unknown, and it is unclear who is ultimately responsible for the cost of cleanup in the event of tanker spill. For large spills, it will probably be the people of Canada. So what I'm asking, uh, one of the asks that I have tonight is that is, uh, we will be coming back to your group and we're going to go out uh, to the public with this issue of the safety of the pipeline as professionals and we'll be doing a, uh, a crowdfunding campaign and we'll be doing, putting this information out to bring the awareness of people of British Columbia that aren't necessarily anti-tar sands or aren't necessarily concerned about global warming, but they just will understand that this is a bad project for British Columbia and very unsafe. So I ask for your help. Thank you, Brian Gunn. And I, I hate to put pressure on you for time limits. What I would suggest to the audience is that we are going to have questions and answers at the end, as you know. You might want to be thinking about the questions that you have of the panelists and putting those, you know, maybe writing them down uh, because there will be a need to be to the point. Uh, with, with your questions, might help you do that. So now we'll move on to Grace, pardon me, <laughs> Krista Grace Moore from Island Tide News. She's the co-founder, owner, publisher, editor, sales manager, and, and tea girl. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. And critical media is endangered in Canada from my viewpoint, and it's critical to democracy. It's how you hold those ministers responsible. Uh, so Island Tides is an independent regional newspaper, large challenge in today's world. Survival speaks of success, I would say. Uh, Island Tide started in 1989. That's more than 20 years ago. I, I also note that Krista Grace Warren is not solely defined by her newspaper. There's a, she had a, you have an interesting and very varied life before, life before Island Tides. Do you think of it in that way? <laughs> At any rate, um, Again, if you want more information, people can always Google you, so uh, please, we would be uh, happy to hear your thoughts, Krista. Thank you, and thank you very much for inviting me to be here. Uh, I've been watching CPOP since they did their first ride down the island, which was, and it's, this organization has done amazing things that this hall is full today is amazing, so give them a big hand. I'm used to being behind a pen or behind a computer screen, so I hope I live up to it <laughs> being here. Um, now what I would like to talk about is the media's role in standing up for our coast. Um, I think we're too quick to discount the media in being an avenue for getting the word out. I'm thinking particularly about newspapers, as I've owned and run one for 25 years. Um, it's become a cliche to say that the media is biased, no good, no help, hopeless. And I don't believe that it, it's true, and I think it does us a disservice to repeat that generalization. It may be true of dailies, but it's far from true about local newspapers, whether they're a part of a chain or not. As budgets are cut and editorial staff dwindles, newspapers will accept both letters and articles from groups and individuals. However, it's up to us to make it easy for them. Write short, one-topic letters, but ones which contain facts, not opinion, and especially not rants or name-calling. Your organization should issue press releases on everything. Once again, not opinion, but fact, succinct, newsy, and with a bit of flavor. Tell them about the meeting you organized, or the meeting you have attended or will attend. Copy your MLA and MP and other representatives. If they know or even think that it will be in print, they will take notice. Writing to representatives is no longer effective, 
almost all party members are whipped into line and can do little and will try to ignore anything that's not part of the party line. The only difference is the Green Party at the moment, which can listen and respond. And that's because they, they're not big, their policy is not to whip, and also there aren't enough of them around to be whipped. <laughs> Um, so, print media, especially local, is, a, is an effective avenue to raise consciousness and to bring pressure to bear. So, it, it just please don't say the media is no good because it's not true, really. Thank you. Thanks so much, Krista. And now, Brian Faulkner, who's from the Rain Coast Conservation Foundation, Marine Operations Program. Brian describes himself as a mariner. What word association does that inspire in you? And maybe it's because I'm you know, from the prairies. I think the ancient mariner. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> At any rate, uh, Brian isn't there yet. Uh, but it is decades of being on the ocean that informs and propels him. Uh, the, the, the foundation, investigate, inform, inspire. Rain Coast is a team of conservationists, and this is on, from the, the website, a team of conservationists and scientists empowered by our research to protect the lands, waters, and wildlife of British Columbia. Uh, you presented very compelling ar arguments to the public against the pipeline proposal from for Alberta and BC um, last year. I know of one. I'm sorry, I don't know all of the places that you've been. Would you care to now enlighten us? Well, probably um, where I've been is less important than the message that I think we're trying to get out. Um, we certainly have tried to get this message across the country about the risk. Um, my role at Rain Coast has been to run the Marine Operations Program, and I've spent 35 years as a commercial mariner on the coast, and so I have an understanding of some of the risks. Rain Coast was an intervener in the National Energy Board hearings, and so throughout all of the risk assessment and spill response sections of that, I had the terrible displeasure to be there and witness that process. A giant truth-eating machine is what we described it as. Um, I was delighted to see in Andrew's presentation um, some notions of the, of the risk and also the uh, spill response because that was a, a very troubling thing to set through. Um, Enbridge is in their uh, risk analysis says that the risk of a, a major spill from a tanker is once in 15,000 years, the mitigated risk uh, return period. Well, there have been 1,200 incidents in the last 10 years before 2009, um, which involved distresses for large ships. In six months, the last six months of 2012, there were five major incidents on the coast of large ships from complete engine failures and drifting for hours in Laredo Sound to groundings of a vessel uh, as it tried to avoid a fish boat uh, to running through the uh, coal port that Brian took so much time to build. Um, there were pilots on all of these, and tethered tugs in some of the cases. All of the mitigating factors that Enbridge points to. So, I guess, in terms of the risk itself, it's just really, really hard to sit and listen to uh, people being, um, try, uh, people attempting to persuade you that there's no risk in this. In studying the terminals in Northern Europe, the longest that I found a terminal to go without a major spill, a major, major incident, either at the terminal or a ship very close coming in or leaving the terminal, was 18 years. The shortest was the first ship that called, exploded and caught fire and sank. Enbridge's presentation of the weather, of weather statistics, was equally difficult to listen to. Um, reporting a particular type of, of uh, parameter that's recorded from the buoys, they managed to turn 10 meter, 26 meter waves into 10 meter waves. And average that over the course of the year, turn it all into three meter waves. So it was, it, it takes far too long to talk about this um, here in, in a few minutes, but what I would like for people to understand is that one of the things that Andrew pointed out in his presentation 
is that where I live, on the north coast of British Columbia, in Hecate Strait, 80% of the time in the winter time, and this is according to Enbridge's own submission of the technological capabilities of spill response, and this is with conventional oil, as Andrew pointed out, 80% of the time, no response is possible, not dispersants, not booming, not recovery of any kind. Monitoring the spill, which means wringing your hands and hoping like heck that it's not going to really go ashore, but it will. So, understanding that the spill response, world-class spill response, 80% of the time in the winter months is to wring your hands. What is a world-class spill response? And. I, I was, again, very grateful to Andrew's presentation for, for pointing that out. The consequences and the extent of a spill are, again, very difficult for people to grasp. We did a little exercise and we brought the area that was affected by the Exxon Valdez spill in 1989 down over the coast of British Columbia and we centered a spill, we centered that, that area on Kamau Sound, one of the most likely places for a major spill. The extent of that spill, if it was, if it behaved in the same way, goes way up into southeast Alaska, covers both shores of Haida Gwaii, both coasts of Vancouver Island, down as far as Campbell River and Tofino. So you go, wow, well, that's not going to get to Partsville. <laughs> the problem is, you've got Kinder Morgan on the other side. And I don't know if some of you caught the media around um, a little scientific experiment that we did. We got involved in a drift study and we launched these little tiny drift cards from Achiever, uh, both in Vancouver and in Harrow Strait and around the bottom end of Vancouver Island, and basically along the Kinder Morgan route. And I encourage you to look at the website for that. And I encourage you to walk your own beaches here and pick up any little four inch by six inch yellow cards that you see, because they will get here and they will be on your beach. And it says on those cards, this could be oil. So, I think I'm gonna try and probably leave it at that. Um, I am on Monday uh, in Nanaimo at VIU, at the First Nations Gathering uh, place. Uh, we have a screening of a wonderful film we did called Groundswell. And I will do a presentation, a little more elaborate presentation, with a little more time on the risks of this as proposed by Enbridge and the risks that we, uh, myself and the community of mariners that, that live on this coast and love this coast, um, the difference in those two viewpoints. So uh, I would welcome any of you um, to come there on Monday night in Nanaimo. And I want to take a moment to thank CPOC um, because I've, I've witnessed this from the very beginning in the first green shirts that I ever saw. And uh, what an amazing group of people and what an amazing, powerful force that this has been in this community. And I thank you so much. Uh, let me see, there we are. Thanks very much, Brian. And now, um, the addressing you, the panelists, um, the audience is going to ask questions of you, but prior to that, each of you might have comments you'd like to make about the information tabled here tonight. And I'm, I'm certain the audience would like to hear uh, the comments that you'd make ab uh, on each other, I guess. It's uh, n certainly not mandatory, but uh, so just if you have something that you feel that you would like to add to what you've heard from your fellow panelists and from Andrew, um, please uh, f feel free. So starting on my left, Andrew, um, are there comments that you'd like to make? And we'd have like a couple of minutes to hear what that might be. I'd prefer to hear, answer questions. Okay. Sure. It's, okay. Brian, do you have something else that you're uh, that something you'd like to add? The only question I like to ask is, uh, is okay. Now, where we were trying to get the other two mics working, are they? Are, we'll need them for the Q and A. I just have a question of uh, Krista, which when she mentioned that uh, it's kind of not very effective to write to your MLAs and MPs and the Prime Minister that they're all herded by the 
parties except for the Green Party. Uh, I believe that, uh, that we have to make an effort in the next few months to really go after these people and get as many people as we can writing letters. I think it's important that we do the press thing as best as possible, but we're certainly going to urge that of our members and the people that we come in touch with. Thank you. I would like to give a specific example of that if I could, because Scott and I both have received more than 2,500 emails from the Ancient Forest Alliance uh, petition that was out there. And I know we were just talking about that. It has had a, an influence on Scott, and, and uh, it shows to him that, uh, as a, uh, the MLA of the region, that this is uh, the Cathedral Grove preservation of the, the horn, uh, the horn um, uh, I forget the last, the horn cap? Horn Valley. Horn, horn, yeah, the Horn Valley? I, Horn Mountain, thank you. Um, I'm tired. <laughs> so I didn't even recognize that. Horn Mountain was, 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 was very important. And again, with us, when we had 2,500 e emails on this topic, we felt this is something that we should also uh, support um, as well. So, so it does have an effect, I agree. Anything else? Okay. So now it's your turn. You came to obtain information. It's been a one-way flow from up here to you. So now we'll get that information, or that, that flow moving the other way from you up, up here. And while you're, well, people, are, you've, you've probably all noticed that there's a floor mic in the center. And, well, you can, like, it's hard to see. You're already starting to line up. That's terrific. Well, more are com coming. What I'll do is uh, to, first of all, um, what I'd like to do is to, um, uh, first of all, we'll have uh, Sherry a ask a question that will be answered by each of the panelists, and then we'll start from the floor. I have four requests, that, and I can never remember four things in a row, but I think you, pro you, you might be able to <laughs> do better than me. Um, please introduce yourself, tell us your name and where you're from, and uh, try to be prepared on point. I would uh, mentioned that before. We're sharing the time with other people. If possible, direct your question to one of the people on stage, uh, but not me. And the, uh, we won't have ev everybody respond to all the questions. So I will try to just do one. And, and here's the challenge, can you say, which I mentioned before. Can you try to keep your comment to about a, a minute's time? Um, so we've, we've asked the panelists to be brief, uh, similarly to be brief, and, um, even, and, it's, and it's difficult because these are complex issues and they can't always be addressed briefly. Um, so the, um, what, uh, so, okay, 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 good for it, okay. All right, I'll hold my question back, but I would like you to weave it in at some time this evening, please. Um, I think our audience has been touched by what they've heard, and please do address what next. Thank you. My name's Richard Boyce, and I'm from Arrington, and I recently returned from a kayak trip to Wright Sound and Douglas Channel. I'm making a, uh, a documentary about about the area where the super tankers have to make three 90 degree turns and uh, it's it, I just posted my first 10 minute video on coastaltarsands.ca so please check it out my question I get really confused because this condensate gas that's coming here from China in over 200 uh, carriers this is an uh, I guess a question may, most appropriate for Andrew Weaver is that material coming from China is uh, very similar to what we're going to be selling to China from all of this fracking in BC and the LNG carriers that are going out of Kitimat. And if you could maybe help, sure. help with that. Condensate is needed because bitumen has the, um, it's like trying to shove peanut butter down through a pipeline, it won't go. It's even, it's even more, more viscous than peanut butter. So it has to be mixed with, with oil-type fluids. Now, 
there's not simply enough being produced in British Columbia. So the, the, the natural gas fields around Fort St. John and the Montney Play, and the reason why they're economical at today's prices is the gas who cares about the gas is the fact that they have the condensates as well as a byproduct. So that's why there, there's some excitement about the Montney Play. Fort Nelson is less um, exciting now because it's too expensive. But so bringing in the condensate is required to make the bitumen viscous to allow it to flow. So it's, it's, you, you might then ask the question, so why aren't we refining this product in Canada and shipping the refined product instead of actually bringing in something to, from the other side of the world to, so that we can transport something to the other side of the world to refine it? I mean, it, it's a legitimate question. Frankly, it makes no sense to me. Even if we were going to ship this stuff, why are we shipping Dilbert and not the refined product for precisely that reason? Thank you. Susan Crosscarry, I live in Nanus, and um, my question is for Andrew Barton. Um, we're really lucky here because we have this group of incredibly dedicated and uh, energetic people who create events like this and keep our community informed. But um, Andrew, you said that uh, in Kelowna, where you come from, you, wouldn't, you would maybe get one row of people in an event like this. And uh, I guess maybe that's got to do with the fact that uh, Kelowna isn't on the coast. But what do you think um, needs to, what do we need to do or what needs to happen to get the rest of the province to have the uh, perspective that we do here and to have the energy to try and um, make something positive happen? Thank you for the question. Uh, it's a really great question and um, the one I reflect a lot, uh, on quite a lot. And, and I think uh, Andrew Weaver uh, touched on it at the end of his presentation and that, that was um, around behavioural change. I think uh, um, the culture of our society is um, one of consumption and we're used to um, resource extraction and all of the, the huge benefits that that brings. And so I, I think increased media campaigns, letter writing campaigns, and, and stories from, um, from average people. Uh, I think the whole, a lot of the issues around climate change is a really great example of that. It doesn't matter how many facts and figures you put out because scientists like Andrew Weaver here have um, shown us the data, but it hasn't brought about uh, the, the cultural change and the, the shift that actually does something. And that's what we need to do. And I think we need to really sort of start focusing on a cultural and social level. And so in some way like uh, Kelowna, there's actually a fairly uh, large population that uh, commutes to Fort McMurray from Kelowna. So um, their family will be based in Kelowna. Um, they'll have a nice big house, big mortgage, big truck. And uh, the, the um, male of the family will generally uh, fly out to Fort Mac for a couple of weeks and come back. So, you know, they have a vested interest in, in this going ahead. Um, so I think that's one of the challenges in Kelowna, but I think we, it's putting the human face on things is my, uh, my perspective. Thank you for the question. Hello, uh, my name is Kevin Story. I've just moved to Parksville, long-term resident of Campbell River. I was, uh, unfortunately, I was in Prince William Sound in 1989 when the Exxon Valdez ran aground. I have two questions, one probably for Brian and one uh, for anybody on the panel. The first one is the size of the tankers. The Exxon Valdez was a coastal tanker, uh, quite a bit smaller. The tankers that are being proposed now I'm not sure what size they are, but if they're long-term tankers, they're four times the size of the Exxon Valdez. Uh, secondly, uh, Mr. Weaver might be able to answer this one. The uh, World Wildlife Fund and one of the largest environmental organizations in the United States states that for every metric ton of LNG that's produced, one metric ton of greenhouse gas is produced. Of all of the current LNG plants that are operating in the world, the average uh, production per year is about 8.8 .8 million 
metric tons. Um, would you care to comment on 8.8 .8 million tons of greenhouse gas per facility times the nine facilities that the government is now proposing? Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll uh, happily take the first one. The very large crude carriers or VLCCs that are proposed for the Enbridge route um, are that much bigger than the Exxon Valdez. Uh, they are 345,000 tons to 370,000 tons. Um, to put it in perspective, two compartments of the VLCC carries more oil than was spilled by the Exxon Valdez. Um, to put that in perspective a little bit again, uh, the drill ship collect that was being towed down from um, up in the North Slope uh, and got into trouble in the waters off of Kodiak Island uh, when the tugboat that was towing it lost four engines simultaneously. There were five ships that tried to keep that from going on the rocks. Those five ships each had more power than the proposed assist tugs um, proposed by Enbridge. Five of them couldn't keep it off the rocks. It was one one thirteenth the size of a VLCC. With, with, I'm, it's late at night and I'm tired and I'm not gonna do the math calculations in my head because I'm gonna mess them up, but if you leave an email, I will give you those calculations when I'm slept. But what I can say is there is no way in a million months of Sundays that we're gonna get nine LNG plants in BC. We may maximally get three if we're lucky, more likely two, possibly one, maybe zero. So, so this is, that, that, you know, this whole LNG thing is a big pipe dream because it requires contracts to be signed at prices that are competitive and they have to be better than what USA or, or Australia or Qatar or Russia can deliver. When we, we will, may get them because of hedging against not wanting to actually get supplies solely from Russia, Iran or Qatar where there's, you know, maybe, maybe a little more unstable. So, so that's, that's, so I, I'm not so worried about nine, you know, three. But with that said, even with those three, if we get the three, we're going to blow out our targets without any question, and there's no way we can simply meet, up, meet them unless we change the rules. So I'm looking forward not, but I'm, looking, I'm, I'm expecting that the government to introduce legislation to move away from its 33% reduction targets by 2020, much like Japan just recently announced in, in Warsaw that they're moving away from 25% reductions to 3% increases over, <laughs> over 1990 levels because they're moving from nuclear to natural gas. Hi, uh, my name's Taryn. I'm a Parksville Arrington resident and also a geographer at VIU. I did two years at UBC too, so yay. Um, did, did Jeff Lewis teach you? Damn straight, Jeff Lewis taught me. Yeah, good, uh, former student. <laughs> um, anyway, um, in geography we spend a lot of time discussing this kind of thing and putting forward all the issues that are in the world that as a person my age we need to start solving, but we don't really put a lot of solutions forward. So I'm wondering if each of you could maybe put something forward that you think that each of us as individuals in this room could do to further um, moving towards maybe a less fossil fuel dependent society or just something that's gonna help this issue not be an issue any longer for future generations. <laughs> just one little thing. <laughs> okay, I'll give you one. I could give you a lot of little things, but I'll give you one. It's the most powerful thing you can do is when you are a consumer and by a consumer you make choices, use your pocketbook to determine the choices you want to spend money on. And why I say that, you can just look at something as simple as organic food. That didn't exist 20 years ago in our grocery stores. You'd be considered a, a loopy if you went and asked like Safeway for where their organic, organic food section is. Because of consumer demand, everybody has a section now. So the consumer demand is what's going to facilitate change and that's the single most important thing an individual can do in a society like ours. I think I would add one thing to that, um, and I think the, there's a classic example of it sitting on the, on the stage here tonight, is one of the single most important things that you could do is when you get into a voting booth, while we still have a democracy, is vote for those changes and, and punish the people who don't um, share those values. Vote for a future, not for the moment, and, and vote uh, not out of fear, but out of the... the, the excitement of positive change.
And I just wanted to add to that, to get involved in your local communities, uh, get involved in your local government and uh, try and uh, get choices made locally that are more sustainable. It's like, yes, I travelled a long way to get here tonight um, that used oil, but at other times and when I have other choices to make, I'll ride a bicycle or I'll walk or I'll choose not to buy something. So uh, it's about those choices and I think getting involved in your community. I would like to say that uh, talk to your neighbors, talk to your uh, grandpa and grandmother and talk to uh, the kids and let them know what your feelings are. It's, it's hard for them some of them to do that because you feel very awkward. But I find, for instance, at the lodge when I talk to people, sometimes people are prepared to listen and sometimes they aren't. But uh, it was interesting to talk to professional engineers and go to my group and talk to them about the pipeline because most of them are pretty conservative and a lot of them I'm sure vote for Mr. Harper but they do care about the coast, they do care about fishing and it's persistence and it's trying to bring those people into the fold that you people are in here tonight. You know many times I feel that we're just speaking to the converted so how do we get the uh, 70 or 80 percent other people out there engaged in this whole project and that means you've got to do something as a young person particularly and say your piece. Thank you. I totally agree. Oh, um, I totally agree with that. That um, to one or two other people about it. it. It has to be moved out, and that's why I I feel it is important to put things out for newspapers um, and whatever other channels you've got. I mean, in great stunts like how long. A VLC is, um, they've done that on Gabriello, you've done that here in Parksville. You can't miss it, it's an amazing trick that, that gets people to focus, you can't help, think of more things like that to do. Um, not necessarily, um, rallies are hard, hard to organize, a lot of work, um, but being creative, you can, there are a lot of, think visual or uh, things that you can do to bring it home to people. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Ellie Thomason and I'm, I go to Bellina Secondary School. I'm in grade 11 and I'm part of this group that is called Civics Action Club and we're trying to make a positive change in the society and um, <laughs> thank you <laughs> and um, we were just wondering, like, how can we get our school full of um, kids who don't really find, or it's f hard for them to find something um, in them to change what's around them because they have it already so good and they don't really see things as clearly as others. So how could we, as a group, um, put forward an idea to better our society in ideas. I don't really have anyone that I'm directing this at. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll <laughs> let Andrew take this in a second here, but I, I just one of the most important things to do, um, I was a redneck bush pilot at one point in my life. Um, I got out into the coast and experienced the ocean and it changed my life. And when you're trying to get something across to people, um, you're talking about something that's really intellectual. If you can get people out into just the, the tiniest places around here, there's lots and lots of nature, there's lots of coast, um, that's the kind of thing that will inspire people and those, it's just love that will ensue from that. I, I fell in love with the coast and it changed my whole viewpoint in life and it made me a very active person. And I think that those kinds of things, those kinds of experiences are really, really important in, in forming um, people to make really positive changes is to actually get away from the TV and get out and experience them. There, there's an organization designed specifically for the question you ask. It's called YesBC, Youth 
something something BC. But it's designed specifically to get youth engaged in exactly the type of questions you're asking. Developing programs that are fun at the school level that, that build leadership, build teamwork, and get people to start thinking about doing things differently. So I'd go on to www.yesbc, it's either .ca or .com, and contact the exec director. She will be put you in touch with either other student leaders in North Vancouver Island area who've done something similar. Lots of schools are, are thinking about the same thing. Reynolds School in my area have done stuff, you know, St. Michael's School down in, in Victoria, they've done tons of stuff. So she'll be able to put you in touch with other students because you guys often have the most wonderful ideas and it's often not us here who can give you the ideas, but when you, she would put you in touch with others, you'll, you'll come up together with things that you can do based on best practices from other schools. Thank you so much. Or e email my office and we'll put you in touch with her. And it's easy to find my, my number. Hi, I'm Tom Schneider. I'm from Coombs. And uh, I have a quick question about the uh, condensate. There's a lot of um, uh, information about the uh, problems with Dilbit, but uh, uh, nobody really knows what the effect of a condensate spill would be. There's a lot of information out there saying it's extremely toxic. And I just wondered what the truth was in that. Am I going to have a quick one? Sure. Uh, if you would like to take it. <laughs> I'm, oh, okay. I, I'm just by default taking this. Look, to condensates are, are the butanes, the propanes, the ethanes, all the anes and, 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 and other light oils mixed together. So it, it's, there's no, it, it's, if you have a, a spill of gasoline in the ocean, at least it floats. If you have a spill of condensates in the ocean, at least it floats. So the difference between condensates, it's, it's, it's another petroleum project. It's mixtures of them. In fact, condensate by definition means a whole bunch of different stuff or depending on which, you know, where it's coming from. So, so it's not one particular product, and, but they all float. So that's the important difference between Dilbit and the condensates. Is, and the reason why you put the condensates in is because they are light. So sure they're toxic, just like gasoline is toxic, just like oil is toxic, but at least they float and parts of them will actually evaporate because they will are some of the lighter substances. But, but there's no question that they're toxic. But they're not anywhere near the same level of the Dilbit. And the Dilbit is a mixture of the, of the nasty stuff with the condensates. I don't know whether that, maybe you can, can you do better than that? Yeah, that's, that's awesome. I just was going to, uh, an anecdote from the hearings, from the Energy Board hearings, uh, when they were discussing response to, deal, to uh, uh, condensate spills. And one of the things that was uh, incredibly important was that the personnel on the ship would not be able to respond, and for a, a significant period of time, first responding vessels wouldn't be able to get close enough because of the evaporation of the, uh, um, the, the, the very, very toxic uh, fumes from it. So it, it itself would inhibit its own uh, response. Yeah, I'd heard uh, 48 hours uh, before they could even go into the area and had no idea if that was true or not. So thank you very much. Well, the, the, you know, one of the things you might actually do in response is ignite it because it is so vaporous too. So that's one of the things that might be done. So. Great. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I don't really have a question directed at the panel, but I, uh, my name is Peter Coles. I live here in Parksville. I moved here four years ago from Ontario. Uh, Brian, and I've met you before. We met at the Rain Coast last year. I represent Robert Bateman's work in Canada. And something that he's been saying for the last 30, 40 years is the species on the planet keeps disappearing and we don't even notice that they're disappearing. And if this spill happens, my concern is that if the wildlife dies on the coast, what makes us think that we can survive that? Well, I, I'm not a, a biologist or an expert in that area, but uh, I know from what I uh, observed out on Haida Gwaii and um, what I've observed through sort of reading the transcripts that uh, um, an interruption of that marine environment of any kind would I think would make it very difficult for um, life to go on in, in those areas. Uh, so I, I think I think it would have a fairly serious impact on 
the ability for humans to be able to uh, inhabit those areas without seriously having to bring in um, a, a lot of extra food and supplies. So I, I think it would have a very serious impact on uh, human well-being in those areas. But anyone else? Is that one on? Yes. Um, I, I, somebody said to me about a year ago, uh, you know that three pillars thing with the environment, the economy and whatever. There's something quite wrong with that because the environment is not parallel with the economy and it, the, the, the diagram is wrong. And I thought about it for quite a long time and I ended up with um, a circle which was sort of environment, environment, environment all around it and the tri a triangle inside it, which was justice, culture, and economy. And uh, that is a far better representation of, of the true situation. There, we're all enclosed by the environment, and clearly, if we mess it up, we're, it, the economy and the culture and justice will not survive. Thank you. All right, I'm Michael. I moved here to Coombs a year ago from Prince George, and my question is for the climate scientists. So there's two core problems being addressed at this presentation dealing with the pipelines, the technological and cultural. You already gave answers to the technological aspect, which with more efficient tech and clean technologies, one I would like to add to that for the combustion engine aspect is us having the ability or the technology to run those engines off water, which has existed for a while now. And I know of a website that sells the fuel cells that do this in, uh, and they're based in the US. And then there's the cultural aspect and why these solutions aren't being implemented. You said it was because the companies are greedy, but you gave no proposals to resolve this problem of greed. Do you see a practical solution in this current system, or would you consider the abandoning of these games we're playing of monetary market economics and politics in favor of a systems approach based off of physical reference to yield these practical solutions we seek? I, I have always said that, in my mind, the single most important thing we should do is internalize the externalities associated with our behavior, which means to put a price on emissions and then let the market find the most efficient solutions. And don't use that as a money grab for government, but to redistribute that money within the economy. And the most efficient way of doing that is to do an upstream uh, tax as opposed to a downstream tax. British Columbia has introduced a downstream tax. We can all see it. An upstream tax is you put it on the price when it comes out of the ground. The problem with that is we need to get other jurisdictions to buy into it. Otherwise, you're just penalizing production in one country or one province relative to the other, which is why the political shenanigans going on in Warsaw are so deeply upsetting. So, so if you put a, mar a price on it, what you would find is, is that the, the, the market will respond. And we just have to look at what happened in BC. British Columbia are the leaders in, 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 in Canada in terms of the use of hybrid vehicles, in terms of bike use in cities, look at Vancouver, in terms of the whole uh, the mindset of councils. Uh, if you go to Victoria, Victoria uh, and you look at in individual communities, they fight amongst themselves. I mean, fight is the wrong word. They compete amongst themselves to see who is the greenest of the municipal councillors. There's a reason why in Victoria, the uh, polit political uh, provincial elections are not between the NDP and the Liberals, it's between the Green and the NDP. That's what's going on in Victoria because of the various you know, competings as to who is greener than elsewhere. So it really is, <clears throat> I mean, I think we can show leadership in BC and I think, I really think it does start through price. That's my, I recognize that not, not everyone agrees, but that's, that's my opinion on that. <laughs> Uh, I have a comment on that, uh, when, when Andrew talks about the market and the concerns about what's happening with our system. I think the problem we have with this <coughs> Northern Gateway Pipeline is it isn't uh, a, a, real, a real market decision because a lot of the costs are hidden from the public or the public don't understand and Gateway are not taking responsibility. For instance, if there is a major spill there is a, a sort of a maximum cap on all the different environmental funds, tier structures and provinces and international tanker funds of 1.6 billion. If that 345,000 tonner were to break up like the Burr did in the North Sea and spill all its oil, 
The cost of cleaning that up based on some of the cost estimates available per barrel of oil is $100 billion. So if those kind of costs are out there and we only got $1.6 billion to pay for it, we're either going to pay that as Canadians or we're going to abandon it and let the environment go to hell. But one way around that and one way around our present problem with Dilbit and shipping Dilbit is to say to Enbridge, when you, when you, these tankers come in, you have to tell them, just like they're doing with their inspection program for ships, you have to say to them, you have to say to the tanker companies, you can't come in here unless you have responsible insurance like Lloyd's of London that will cover the cost of the cargo you're carrying and the cleanup costs. And I'm willing to bet that if they did that, that the price of a barrel of oil would go way up and that would change the whole economics of shipping Dilbit to China. It might be a lot cheaper to ship the refined product, the light crude oil, and then ship the petroleum coke that they want to make the roads because the real cost of shipping Dilbit is that price for cleaning up. And that's what I think needs to be taken into account and that's something that Enbridge could do. And I'd, I'd just like to add one, one quick thing to that, to Brian, that, uh, that uh, that's the cost of apparently cleaning it up. And what that means is sweeping it under the rug. A hundred billion dollars would sweep it under the rug. Twenty-one years later, there is still oil as undegraded as the day it was spilled in Prince William Sound. So even if the cleanup was effective in terms of visual, um, as, as our own provincial government spill response study just released, um, you're not going to recover even probably 15 to 25 percent of the oil. So ensuring it is one aspect of it, it might, if you actually had to pay the costs of even making it look like it went away, um, it might change the, the price of oil. But it's good to remember that it will never be clean. And, and just to step back to the um, point on pricing for a moment, uh, willingness to pay is what economists use as a way to measure uh, how much we value things that don't necessarily have market prices. And so there's a lot of uh, research being done about our willingness to pay for endangered species, for example, and how that relates to um, our opinions about the environment and the way that we see the environment. And unsurprisingly, if um, people that show a strong connection to the environment and value the environment are willing to pay more for things like uh, endangered species. And, and so a lot of these issues are around cost, is that a lot of us don't want to pay more for the cheap stuff that we get that's made from petroleum products. And by, uh, I think, by shifting culture, by educating, by doing little things in communities, by getting our friends out for walks out in the bush or taking them out uh, onto the ocean to our favourite places, we start to educate people and we start to shift that culture. And uh, people are then uh, more willing to pay for the things that they're getting. And rather than uh, objecting vigorously to a carbon tax, people might start saying, yeah, you know, it's probably not a bad idea. We really need to pay for these things so uh, we can protect the environment. So I think there's a really, really strong cultural uh, component to this as well. I just wanted to, that was a good the last response there, I, I felt, although, Overall, I felt my questions weren't entirely answered, so I'd like to maybe if after be able to talk some more about that. That'd be great. Hi, my name's Mitchell. I'm from Qualcomm Beach. Um, comment and a question. Um, comment, actually, Brian touched on already. Um, you don't clean this stuff up. Um, I was trained as a chemist. I worked in the tar pits in well, way back 35 years ago. I refuse to call them oil sands because they're tar pits. And I think this is something the media can help us do, is to um, call a spade a spade. Um, a couple of word, a word that I've heard tonight too many times is clean up. You don't clean it up. You sequester it, you convert it, or you um, hide it under the rug. It's not like spilling olive oil on your kitchen counter. You know, even that goes in the paper towel, goes in the garbage, goes somewhere. It's not gone. Right? So let's not use the word clean up anymore. Let's just mitigate the, the hazard or, or hide the hazard or something like that. But it, there is no clean up. Right? First thing. Um, 
And um, my, my question then is uh, interprovincial transport, um, including pipelines, is a federal jurisdiction. So even if every single citizen of British Columbia said no to the pipeline, can't Ottawa just say, too bad, give us a raspberry and proceed? The, the um, a piece of policy was put in place and the NDP actually, uh, one of the things they had uh, said they would do, which I totally supported, was actually get the equivalency agreement out, out which is basically saying that the province and the feds are sharing the environmental responsibility, uh, uh, environmental assessment process. Therein is our ticket, is through that environmental assessment projects, but we've essentially given that to Ottawa, so given away our potential uh, uh, oversight of these projects. So there is a danger, well Ottawa can just ram it through. The thing that's going for us is this, if we turn the clock back and go to the Trudeau era, when the National Energy uh, uh, Program was, was developed by Trudeau, Alberta revolted and the Western uh, Canadian separatist movement began as a direct consequence of Ottawa being perceived as, as, as ramming down the throats of Alberta in national energy policy. Well here we are today in 2013 and it's exactly the opposite. People across Canada are thinking Alberta through Ottawa is ramming down their, their throats on a national ener energy policy. So that, the, 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 that, that analogy is not going to be lost, I think, on the Conservative government. There are 20 something MPs, Conservative MPs in British Columbia. If, if we get this rammed down our throats because of the, uh, 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 against our will, then I suspect that there will be 20 odd less Conservative MPs going to Ottawa in 2015. Thank you. Uh, following the same theme, although I'll just t touch on that on Monday, the 25th, the I'm Scott Fraser, I'm the MLA for Alberta Pacific Rim. Sorry, uh, the um, the federal government's uh, draconian fisheries act gutting is happening. It, it's it, that that begins on Monday, so the removal of the habitat protection from the fisheries act begins on Monday. So. Uh, hopefully that will come home to roost on somebody because that's there to facilitate things like the Enbridge pipeline. But uh, it's, I'm going to follow the same theme as the last question and, uh, and uh, I'm not, I don't have his expertise but I worked in the oil refining business for a lot of years and uh, including oil recovery and the world class oil recovery again. Um, and Brian, you've touched on it. There, the, there's still oil in, in from, the, from the Exxon Valdez. I mean that, there was a lot of people spraying rocks and stuff but there's still oil there. They, they didn't actually do a cleanup. So in a dill bit spill, my understanding is it, that's a three-dimensional spill, the benthic layer. It's, it's, and the only actual technology for, for, for addressing the world-class um, response is, is trying to put a floating boom around it. Uh, in the Gulf, we know that uh, they tried chemical dispersants. That's the only new technology as such that the industry has, but that turns out to be more lethal than the oil itself, so that's not an option. But the only thing they have is a floating boom. So if, I, if you get one of these super tankers crack up in Hecate Strait at, in a storm, which is when it would happen, which they have all the time, um, you got to put a boom around it. Well, the only time, well, booms only work in a bathtub. We've, I've deployed them. It, they don't work when there's wind, when there's waves, when there's tides, when there's a storm. And so, um, there is, again, like the, the previous uh, speaker spoke, there, this is a three-dimensional spill. There is no cleanup. There might be ways to mitigate damage like by, by paying people off because we've ruined your fisheries, we've ruined the crab, we've ruined the coast for the tourism. But how do you, does anyone know, how would you assess compensation that's, that's basically permanent? Because it isn't cleanup. Uh, it, how would you, how, who would assess that? What insurance company would be able to assess that damage? You, you just described the most painful week of my life. Uh, we're sitting in the hearings and listening to the debate about whether Dilbit sinks. And the ridiculous uh, tank testing that was done on very tiny bits of selected pieces of it in 30 degree centigrade water with uh, seven knots of wind and a half a knot of tide in a tank and it's still sunk. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it, there's so many factors involved in spill response and what you understand when you understand the technologies of spill response is that 
the most sophisticated booms in the world do not work in seas above 1.3 meters. Okay? You've seen on your beach lots and lots of days in the wintertime when it exceeds that. Dispersants can be used if the oil is thick enough, that is if you can boom it enough and get it thick enough, the dispersants will be effective to 3 meter seas. 80% of the time, through the winter months, that's not possible. Even assuming you could get the small equipment that Enbridge is talking about, because they don't want to buy big ships, that they think that multiple smaller pieces are, are more effective, except out in Hecate Strait, in Den, January and February and March. <laughs> so, aside from whether it will sink or float, the conventional technologies will not even work on conventional crude. Add the three-dimensional aspect of that, that even if it sinks two inches below the water, due to absorption of plankton, absorption of krill, uh, absorption of, of sediments, which a lot of Douglas Channel has, booms are not going to reach it, dispersant is not going to reach it, but it's going to disperse through the water column and uh, an incredible variety of the most beautiful sea life on the planet is going to ingest, absorb, and suffer from it. So the reality of world-class spill response is that it does not exist. Perhaps on another planet. We'll make this the last two questions. Hi there, my name is Parker Hedges, live uh, locally here. Um, I'm a big supporter of the, uh, the uh, Ancient Forest Alliance, and I'm glad we have our MLA here to st stick up and you know, uh, protect the environments that are right here around our oceans and forests. Um, it seems like we've all reached a common conclusion here tonight that um, there is no fix for a spill which should mean it should go back to the fundamentals of ABC 1, 2, 3, and that's if there's any compromise on environment over money or any way to sweep it under the rug or any way for a government person to be paid off or a cleaning spill uh, initiative to be paid off, it will happen. So don't play with the environment. We need to start learning how to group up as larger than communities and grouping up as an island to defend what's here. And it starts here and then it can move globally, but unfortunately the baby steps of ABC 123 are not us discussing what happens if a spill happens. It's never letting it get to the point. And it's time to start reversing back. We've all become more awake here. Uh, my question is, how do we come together to protect our coasts and our inland remaining old growth forests at the same time? And is there a plan to unite those people because it's more people to fight for the cause? One thing I would say is that it's every act of every person or two people together or three people, it doesn't have to be um, really big um, events. It, it simply just has to be spread out further. Um, it, it's the ver it's more, more a distributed thing. Uh, the big events are great, but never uh, doubt that every act that you take uh, is useful and will cause a tipping point at some point. I mean, you've still got a federal government to, that seems determined um, that's in charge, but who knows, you can't stop now, you have to keep doing it. Uh, I'd like to say uh, the reason I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing is because, you could say as an engineer and as a person that loves the outdoors, I've kind of seen the light in terms of what's being proposed at Northern Gateway. But the problem here is, I sit here and I listen to the audience and I hear the comments, we're all speaking to the converted most times and we're all talking to each other about all the things that are going to happen with that and we're not reaching out to the community that just sort of says, well, we, we've got the tar sands, come on, uh, the tar sands industry, every second person on Vancouver Island has a job in Alberta, 
We can't stop that machine. We can't. Uh, we, we, we can't just say hooray for the environment and, and, and think about global warming and stop the economy. And so what we've tried to do as professional engineers is, is try, we're trying to reach out to those people who are not in the environmental movement, but who, are, who care about the economy, but who also care about nature and have some difficult choices to make. And those people are not aware of what you and I are aware of tonight. They're not aware of what Andrew Weaver talks about. They're not aware of the, the risk of the spills. And how do we bring that awareness to them? What we're going to try and do with the uh, concerned professional engineers is reach out to all the engineers that we know. We're going to try and put together a social media marketing campaign. It's a little late in the game, but we're going to try and get this message out to the people who are not involved, people who don't come to these meetings, but the people who do Really, do, they do care about the economy, they do care about the work for their kids, uh, and they do care about the environment and the fact that they're going to spoil the fishing and so on, but they need to know what the alternatives are. How's that economy going to keep running? How am I going to keep my job? How's my old age pension going to last? And, and these kind of things. So I say to you tonight that, that, that the biggest thing you can do is what that young lady was saying, is you've got to talk to your other community and bring their attention to this fact. You've got to talk to the old folks like me and the rest who are worried about our, our security and our old age and, and those people that voted for Harper because he's going to keep the economy going. He's going to keep my old age pension going. Thanks. Uh, I want to absolutely reinforce what was just said. And let me give you an example, a very concrete personal example. The riding I am in Oak Bay Gordon Head is a combination between West Vancouver, we have the Uplands, which is the British properties of North Vancouver, and Point Grey, which is the very wealthy part of the Oak Bay plus University. It has been a liberal riding for the last 17 years. It was a, it, for a short term, it went through Elizabeth Cull when the NDP, uh, when the Liberals ran against the Socrates and the right of center uh, vote was split. And prior to that, it was held by Scott Wallace, who was actually a conservative member. The reason why Oak Bay Gordon Head actually voted green was because this is a very, very conservative writing because when I was talking, it was always about you can't separate the economy from the environment. When I talk about LNG, I have never once talked about the environmental effects of fracking. I've only focused on the economic folly of putting all your eggs in one basket which is something that people resonate with. It. And rather than just saying no against something, when you offer them an opportunity, like the clean tech sector, which has four times as many jobs in British Columbia as the oil and gas sector, the film industry in BC has four times as many jobs as the oil, gas, and mining sectors combined. So there's a lot of nonsense out there put forward by special groups, which are trying to get you to think that you have to vote for jobs means getting a shovel and digging dirt out when the reality is there's a diversity of job areas in the province. But you can't, you can't just go and talk environment, you have to always offer a solution. If not this, then what? And that was the secret to success in Oak Bay Gordon Head, which was the highest voter turnout in the province of British Columbia, so people actually felt there was something to vote for, which is a combination between environment and the economy. And the second highest voter turnout in the province of British Columbia was Adam Olson in Saanich, uh, Gulf Islands, which was 68%. We were six, almost 70% in our writing. So, so again, it was a three-way race there. It's, it's, it's about talking about linking the environment to the economy, and I, and I firmly believe that I can't emphasize that enough. Thank you for raising that. And on that note, um, I just have one quick more question here, and that's if we then took the, uh, changed a few of the laws to protect the environment within BC and made an example of those laws on a global scale and turned the jobs then, creating jobs to protect the new laws that were in place, would that not create the job loss? I think we'll move to the next speaker. I think we'll move to the next speaker. <coughs> My name is Sylvia Hofstetter, and I live in Qualicum. I'm a retired school teacher and a very active Green member. <laughs> um, my problem is Christy Clark. Now, <laughs> I think many people have that problem. <laughs> I'm so. She happens to be my MLA. <laughs> 
I'm so concerned that she has too much power. She's only a premier, but she thinks she owns the land, the atmosphere, the oceans and everything. And I see her on TV like a loose cannon, you know. But how much, anyhow, I wish she was here. And I would like to make a suggestion to all of you that could you have a public debate on TV so the world, and especially BC, could see how uneducated she is about <laughs> things like this. I mean, how, when you hear Elizabeth May take on people, you know, she's got all the quips and, and the answers, and she has a marvelous uh, a photographic memory and everything. But um, I think if she, I'm trying not to be rude, but, but expose her ignorance so that she doesn't have as much power. I mean, I'm very concerned that one woman can blow it all. So what's the good of all this wonderful talk and insight and all your hard work if one person can blow it? I don't think she has the power in the Liberal government. That's, I think that she comes from a more, she, she's a populist, that she goes with what popular opinion is. So she'll say, what people want to hear. And so, but my worry is not Christy Clark. It's Minister Coleman and Minister Bennett, who are in charge of the energy and LNG files. Oh. To me, if I were to say who are the people that I worry about, it's those two, because they have the power. Because they have the portfolios that she campaigned on in their control. And they are very, very well versed, versed on those pro, pro, portfolios. I don't know whether Scott would agree with me on that, but, but I'd, I'd be really interested in Scott's opinion on that too. That's my take on it, is I don't worry so much about her. I worry about those two, because they're the power brokers in this government with those two portfolios. Could you have Do you disagree, Scott? Or? <laughs> you both say agree. Okay, if you might have some further on that, I, if you... Well, I know we're short on time. Okay, okay. No, no, so I wanted to be with <laughs> Just, just quickly, Scott and I sit next to each other in the legislature, so it's uh, it's really fun time. I always talk at him, and he can turn me off, but I, I enjoy sitting next to Scott in the legislature. Oh yeah, as pointed out, for like those two days a year that we actually get to do that. Now we did promise that we would wrap this up at 9:30, and we'd like to try to keep our promise. But I want to thank the panel very much for their responses tonight. And just before you go, one more thing that you could do if you haven't thought of lots of ideas from the panel is join CPOC yeah. and wear a green shirt and wear it to play squash or go running or do the gardening or whatever, but just wear your green shirt. That, I, that just helps to bring the cause to the light. So drive home safely and thank you so much for coming.